Good afternoon. I am delighted to welcome all of you to this conference on the evolving role of universities in the American research ecosystem. This conference is sponsored by the Center for Innovation Policy at Duke Law. It is also co-sponsored by the Duke Office of Research and Innovation, the Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative, and the Duke Law Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security. I'm Artie Rye, a professor at Duke Law School and faculty co-director of the Center for Innovation Policy. I am joined by the other faculty co-director of the center, Duke Law Professor Stuart Benjamin, and by our center's executive director, Professor Dennis Simon, who is also a professor of the practice at Duke's Fuqua Business School. Each of us will be moderating panels over the course of the next two days. Stuart will moderate panel two, Dennis panel three, and I will moderate panel four. Before I talk about the goals of the conference, I wanna say a few words about the Center for Innovation Policy. The center is a forum for independent, nonpartisan analysis and balanced discussion of policies for promoting technological innovation that enhances social welfare. This conference highlights that goal. The center is based at Duke Law, but in the rich multidisciplinary uh, tradition of Duke, we are honored to draw upon the wide ranging expertise of the full panoply of Duke schools, including the business school, the policy school, the engineering school, and the medical school. Outside of Duke, we receive funding from government and nonprofit foundation sources. All of our funders are listed on our website. Any relevant disclosures from speakers at this conference are also on our website. More generally, you can find out much more about us on our website, www.law.duke.edu slash innovation policy. A few quick logistical notes before I get to some more substantive comments. The conference is being recorded and will be available on the Duke Law YouTube channel in about a week. Only the speakers are being recorded. Members of the audience will not be recorded. You can ask questions at any time using the Zoom Q&A function, and we will get to as many of your questions as time allows. If you have any technical problems, please use the Zoom Q&A function to submit them. Start the message with, quote, technical issue, unquote. Now on to the conference. This conference it brings together groups of individuals and topics that overlap in terms of relevance to innovation and to universities, but are often treated as their own silos. For instance, those who focus on STEM-focused immigration may not routinely talk to those who focus on technology commercialization. One important goal of this conference is to bring the different groups together. All have different contributions to make in the conversation on university's changing role with respect to innovation. This is a particularly opportune time to have a high level innovation conference that crosses some of the ordinary disciplinary boundaries. That's the case for at least two reasons. First, it's a very important time to think about the role of innovation in US economic competitiveness and national security. Most recently, this issue has been highlighted by concerns about dramatic US shortfalls in advanced manufacturing, including in semiconductors. Universities are a key institution from which great STEM-related ideas, educational programming, and strategic partnerships that will spur competitiveness will emerge. Second, the so-called fourth industrial age is upon us. Now, depending on one's perspective, this era could represent evolution or revolution relative to the earlier digital revolution. Regardless, it's clear that technologies like artificial intelligence, biotechnology, quantum and cloud computing, and 5G wireless are changing the economic, strategic, and security calculus. That latter point about technological change is of course central to our conference. Throughout the conference, we will be returning to specific technologies and the extent to which they require incremental versus fundamental changes in policy thinking. Our larger hope, however, is to inform and shape the policy debate. 
So on that first policy focus front, there have arguably been three distinct eras in the post-World War II American research ecosystem. The first era involved a Cold War focus. This era produced large amounts of government funding, often directed to defense firms, but also to universities' own defense-related research. As many of you probably know, DARPA originated in this era. In fact, in 1960, the US Defense Department funded one third of all global R&D. Many university affiliated national labs were also created in this era. The second era was ushered in by the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980, which focused specifically on universities. Bayh-Dole ranged across all areas of research and was intended to promote commercialization of university-based research to address what was then perceived as a great economic challenge to the United States in the form of Japan. Two years later in 1982, the government began issuing small business innovation research and small business technology transfer awards to innovative small businesses. The small business technology transfer awards in particular focus on university originated startups. The idea is that these awards can help technologies that are um, created in universities to cross the funding valley of death into commercial viability. The third era, which we're in now, involves significant competitiveness and security concerns, perhaps particularly with respect to China. That leads me to a brief introduction for the three panels that will follow our first president's panel and keynote speech. These panels will cover immigration, national security, and university industry collaboration. As to the first, there is great interest among policymakers in poss possible changes to immigration policies in STEM-related fields. But even in the absence of legislative reform, the executive branch is beginning to take action. For example, in January 2022, the administration announced a number of steps to ease the path for collaboration with STEM-focused foreign students and scholars and also to ease paths for legal immigration for these students and scholars. As we all know, universities rely heavily on foreign students and scholars, particularly in STEM fields. An obvious question is whether and how universities should adjust their approach. That will be the focus of our second panel. Then there's national security. The Trump administration created a Department of Justice China initiative to investigate professors, among others, for espionage and cyber threats. The Biden administration ended that initiative last week. The end of the program means the Justice Department will retire the China initiative name and set a higher bar for prosecutions of academics and researchers who arguably mislead the government about Chinese affiliations. For our purposes, the larger question is the role that the challenging intersection of national security with international scientific cooperation should play for universities. In what ways should universities be more international and what ways should they focus on national security? That will be the focus of our third panel. Finally, particularly as inflation adjusted government funding of university research has plateaued or even declined, university industry relations have become more important than ever. These relations will be the focus of our last panel. If these bills can be recognized, the Senate's United States Innovation and Competition Act and the House counterpart, the America Compete Act of 2022, would provide tens of billions of additional new government funding, including for universities. But whether, whether or not those bills become law, university industry relations likely will be continuing to increase in importance. In fact, the bills themselves offer the possibility of billions of dollars for tech hubs that spur cooperation between universities and industry. Many cities want to be tech hubs and contribute to regional economic uh, growth and job creation. Is that vision a plausible one? How should universities weigh competing demands from established, um, established companies relative to startups, including professor and student generated startups? Those are some of the questions the last panel will address. So in some universities have been central to the innovation ecosystem for decades, but are facing a new landscape. In this conference, we've brought together some of the most important people on these issues for a frank conversation. 
As an example, we're beginning the conference with five presidents from R1 comprehensive research universities. These universities represent the top tier in terms of scholarship and research productivity. They're important not only on the national and international level, but also to their respective regional economies. The presence of these extremely busy presidents speaks volumes regarding the importance of the topic. Our panels and our audience also include many senior experienced academic leaders in the areas of technology and innovation. I think they would all agree that US, US universities are still world leaders. But I think they would also agree that universities will need to adjust and change in the future as they position themselves for meeting the innovation challenges of the next several decades. We plan to summarize all these key points and findings in a white paper. Our prior white papers and research from our faculty affiliates has been highly influential in, sh in shaping policy debates and legislation. And we hope that this white paper will be influ influential as well. Now, let me introduce our keynote speaker who is exceedingly well suited to address this topic. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Michael Crow, who became the 16th president of Arizona State University in July 2002. Dr. Crow has spearheaded ASU's evolution into the, one of the world's best public metropolitan research universities. For seven consecutive years, ASU has been lauded as the most innovative school in the nation by US News and World Report. Under Dr. Crow's leadership, ASU has established 25 new transdisciplinary schools, including the School of Earth and Space Exploration, the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, and the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. It has also launched a host of multidisciplinary initiatives, including the Biodesign Initiative, or Institute, excuse me, and the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. Dr. Crow, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Artie. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see everyone else. Can people hear me okay? Can you hear me all right? <clears throat> okay, great. So what I thought I would do here is spend a few minutes uh, before I turn to the questions that the group has put together and, and, and really uh, uh, take on this issue of the evolving role of the universities in the American innovation system. And I think this notion of the new landscape is, is really important to sort of get down. And I'll do that a little bit by you know, basically uh, trying to bring you all up to speed a little bit on the evolution of a new kind of American university, which we represent out here in Arizona in a sort of the frontier certainly the social and economic frontier and cultural frontier of the country as it's still evolving. And, and so let me start by saying that, you know, we've uh, rechartered our university in the last um, uh, decade and a half or so around the notion that the measurement of the success of the university goes beyond the measurement of the success of the graduates of the university. And I say this in the context of the evolving role of the universities in the American innovation system. Our charter has three parts to it. The measurement of the success of the university will be based on who we include and how they succeed versus who we exclude. The second part will be uh, building a research enterprise, which we've done, uh, which is measuring its success not only academically, but also economically and socially in terms of impacts and actually going out and measuring those. And then perhaps most important to this uh, uh, conversation today, the university taking on uh, responsibility for outcomes outside the university. So how competitive are we or aren't we? Uh, how successful is our K-12 system or not? Uh, how successful are we in competing against China or not? And so uh, don't see this as a single university centric thing that I'm focusing on only. See this as an evolving new design, if you will, an evolving new, new way that the uh, institution is, uh, is really moving forward. So having said that then, let me take on this notion of the nature of evolution. So as we've evolved and as we take on responsibility, and this is really an important measurement here, as we say that we are partly responsible for the economic success of our region and our country, we're responsible for the social success and social transformation of our region and our country, we're responsible for the health and well-being uh, uh, and social equity of our region and our country, that then begins to reshape what you're doing. And so it means then that at least in this region of the United States, and I think importantly, relative to the uh, success of the country, 
We've changed the scale of the university. We've grown from 40,000 degree seeking students two decades ago to 150,000 degree seeking students uh, this semester, this year, uh, with 60,000 of those as STEM majors. And I'll come back to that, meaning, meaning one of the evolving characteristics of this institution is in fact uh, scale. And so uh, uh, a second thing that we've been working on that I think again uh, goes to this notion of evolving and a lot of universities are doing these things and I'm not suggesting that we're the only ones is that we have seven active innovation campuses under development in which we co-locate with, stimulate with, uh, partner with, evolve with um, uh, uh, not only companies, but companies, governments, alliances, uh, international companies, American companies, uh, uh, conglomerations of, of uh, enterprises, uh, uh, all, all kinds of things. And we've got seven of these un under development uh, in metropolitan Phoenix itself, including millions of square feet uh, up and built and moving forward uh, with uh, hundreds, thousands of acres uh, of property that's uh, set aside to uh, evolve these things, including partnerships. One of these campuses is with the Mayo Clinic uh, in North Phoenix, where uh, about 500 acres have been assembled as a part of an emergence of a whole new way to create an innovation campus around the future of healthcare. And that's just one of seven of these that we're working on. Uh, uh, another thing that we're, that we're doing is we're expanding uh, beyond as the university's design, the intense focus on individual researchers, individual faculty members uh, and centers. Now we're not diminishing that. Uh, we've evolved our research enterprise to more than $700 million a year of research expenditures without a medical school, which is a very substantial and healthy uh, uh, thing that we've been able to do. But we have an intense focus underway now to birth new major laboratories. Uh, already mentioned uh, in the introduction, our new Global Futures Laboratory, which is since the US government and global governments won't build laboratories that are focused on something other than what they've been historically focused on, weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, agricultural laboratories, uh, space laboratories, and so forth, we're launching the Global Futures Laboratory with dozens of partners, hundreds of faculty members, uh, multinational alliances, uh, new facilities, new programs, philanthropy, government funding, all these things. And so we're attempting to grow new, new in the spirit, again, of evolving universities, new macro scale entities that are not derivative only of government policy. We have other ones of these that we're building beyond the Global Futures Laboratory. We have a thing called the Interplanetary Initiative, which is focused on, of all things, uh, uh, not just exploration of space, but uh, 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 asteroid mining, all kinds of things. We have companies that are working with us, companies that are funding us, making these things happen. So beyond changing the scale of the institution and changing the scale of our STEM enterprise, you know, we're also uh, expanding the, the focus of the institution beyond individual researchers and centers to what can we do as a catalyst for, for the emergence of whole new classes and whole new types of institutions. Uh, uh, the next thing that we've been focused on in the spirit of evolving universities is to enhance the outcome focus of some research, meaning, yes, we're, we're uh, unbelievably committed to curiosity-driven research. We're also unbelievably committed to outcome-oriented research, thus our new School of Sustainability in our College of Global Futures, our School for the Future of Innovation and Society, our new economy initiative where we're, we're launching uh, center after center after center with public support, private support, private partnerships, uh, uh, and there are complexities as Artie was suggesting in all of this, but we're launching entire new research centers and technology centers that are built around laying the foundation for the new economy laying the foundation for the for all aspects of the new economy and so that's uh, you know moving and and don't think of this as applied research because when you're dealing in in quantum computing or ai or or machine learning or uh, computational life sciences or other really complicated areas you're just laying the foundation for the future economy as a focused part of your overall objective uh, another thing that we've been working on is uh, and this has been accelerating during covid but even even before COVID, is the, the building of teaching, learning, and discovery capacities inside companies uh, in which the university becomes the company's uh, uh, learning partner, becomes the company's uh, learning adaptation partner. Uh, we've got major efforts underway uh, in probably 10 companies where we're doing this, major corporations, uh, where we're working on uh, new, new labs, new initiatives, new degree programs, 
uh, new customized degree programs, uh, you know, can you, can you build? And lots of universities are doing this, but this is now becoming a systematic thing that we're really uh, focused on in, in very significant ways. Uh, one thing that we think is essential to the evolving of the universities in the United States is scale, particularly when one looks at the uh, evolution of the American innovation system. And I'll just pick in engineering. So in engineering, 10 years ago, we had a traditional engineering school built on what we call the weed out uh, culture model. You admit lots of students to the engineering school. And then uh, if they, if they uh, can't handle the calculus, they're gone. If they can't handle the chemistry, they're gone. The weed out culture. So we had about 6,000 students in engineering and we had a low freshman retention rate of under 70%. Uh, and that was the way, that by the way, is the way that uh, uh, many, many uh, universities uh, operate their engineering school. And we thought, well, that's stupid. That's not going to really move us forward in the way that we'd really like to go. So we began a systematic effort, effort uh, with a lot of uh, help uh, from the leader then at the time of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, uh, who was able to spend time here with us, was able to then give us a sense of, of what they thought would be needed to help the United States to be more innovative. And that was uh, uh, the, the, this whole notion of moving away from traditional designs in engineering and moving towards uh, grand challenges as a way to attract people to engineering. So what we decided to do was to uh, 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 take Chuck Vest's ideas, uh, former president of MIT, president of the National Academy of Engineering at, at the time, now the late Chuck Vest. And he said, I'm, I'm looking for somebody that can build grand challenge engineering programs. So we took on the task of eliminating all 11 of our engineering departments. We took on the task of building a coupling mechanism to, uh, of technology enhanced learning tools that could help people to become masters of calculus, that could help people to become masters of, of basic biology or basic chemistry, so that more students could then enter into engineering with all of their creativity, with the schools, with the skills that they needed. So we created five grand challenge engineering schools. We created a polytechnic engineering school. We grew engineering from 6,000 students on campus to 18,000 students on campus much more diverse, much more broad, uh, unbelievably empowered. And then because of the technology that we put in place, we got the first three fully accredited online undergraduate, ABET accredited online engineering degrees now up and running. So now we added another 9,000 students in engineering that now brings us to 27,000 students in engineering. And what we're looking to do, and this is in the spirit of competing against China and the spirit of competing against other rising economies is to grow engineering Roughly to 40,000 students is our overall objective. And oh, by the way, we, we took freshman retention from 67% to 90%. So we're very excited about the things that we're able to do with the new kind of design, the new kind of structure, including new schools that were evolving around this grand challenge experience, including an international school that we launched in London with King's College London as our partner and the University of New South Wales from Sydney, uh, Australia as our partner called Teddy the Engineering Design Institute of London, which is now up and running. So we've also been working to expand engineering. We've also been trying to enhance science and technology literacy as a way to further enhance the competitiveness of the American innovation system. I mean, I think our present view is that the most powerful graduate that we're producing is a philosophy major that can code or an English major that can speak some sort of coding language. Uh, uh, and then who knows what they can do across many, many dimensions. And so We've also reconstructed the design of our university uh, in a way in which it can also teach and learn in an accelerated and enhanced ways to allow double majoring, triple majoring, more minors, as well as enhancements in science and technology literacy. In fact, this is the first semester at ASU where we have, uh, 800, we have about 1,000 students taking their biology laboratory in an entirely virtual reality environment in a fictional alien zoo with thousands of species that don't exist on earth where you go up to this space station and you then take your biology lab in this space station. And what we're seeing is unbelievable transformation in the learning outcomes of those individuals. And that's what we call accelerating science and technology literacy. We're doing this in our digital high school also. We're doing this in the public charter schools that we're running. And then I think the other thing that we've been doing is uh, greatly enhancing our entrepreneurship and innovation activities by uh, going out into the community, into the neighborhoods, into the various sectors of the economy here in the Southwest, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and, 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 and working together in this region to just greatly enhance and, and intensify entrepreneurship and innovation training and opportunities, 
not only within the university where we, we've got more and more startup companies coming out of the students, hundreds uh, per year now, I mean, hundreds. Uh, and so just accelerating all of that, we formed an entrepreneurship and innovation institute, got that endowment funded and moving forward. So these are not the only things that we're doing, but these are, I think in some ways, the evolving role of the universities. To the four discussion questions, uh, Artie, I don't know if you want me to go right into those. I can, I can give you my early answers to the four questions I was given. Uh, or we can or we can do those as a group. So it's up to you. Happy either way. Well, let me take the first one then. Does the current wave of potentially transformative technologies as in AI, artificial intelligence, or what we call augmented intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, computational life sciences pose any distinct issues for universities? Absolutely issues because this is now for the first time going to be something where there's not going to be necessarily uh, single dominant hubs of activity or regional hubs of activity, meaning there's gonna be people working in these areas, quantum computing, computational life sciences, AI and machine learning everywhere. And so we now have fantastically global competition. Uh, it's gonna be move, moving quickly. It's gonna be moving at scale. The, the, the uh, New South Wales government in Australia is putting huge amounts of money into quantum computing. The Arizona state government here in the United States is putting uh, giving us resources to help launch five new uh, unbelievable uh, research centers, uh, technology development centers, all geared towards laying the foundation for future industries. And then the second part of the question is, are there issues or does it pose issues? It, it poses issues of, are we fast enough? Can we scale enough? Can we compete well enough? Can we engage uh, well enough? Uh, can we sustain our you know, really, really creative energies? And then the second part of the question is, are U.S. universities positioned to produce the types of graduates we need in those fields? The answer is, Yes, but not enough of them because we still basically buy off on the notion that only a few people can learn how to do these things, which, which we now know that that's not the case. And so, you know, the issue then, are we well positioned? The answer is we're well positioned, but not at scale. And then uh, the second, the second, third part of that question is what should universities do differently to produce such graduates? And it's, it goes to broaden the scale enhance more double, triple majors, uh, uh, enhance ways for people to learn across their lifetime, which a lot of us are doing, but we need to do more. Second question, uh, are there steps that universities should take beyond their traditional activities to foster the development of such technology hubs? Well, I just walked through seven or eight of them that we're doing down here in the hinterland of the Sonoran Desert. And that is, you know, uh, more innovation campuses, more partnerships, more alliances, more scale, more STEM, more science and technology, uh, literacy enhancement, more entrepreneurship and innovation things, and everybody's doing this. And if one is small or isolated, one might want to then do that in broader uh, partnerships. The third question on my list here is, how should universities approach cross-border collaboration and cooperation in light of national security concerns? Well, um, uh, carefully, cautiously, uh, in a focused way, and what I mean by that is, um, uh, yeah, we've got to be concerned about how we're going to, uh, 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 let's use hockey as an analogy. So let's pretend hockey is the international competitive arena. I'm all for full contact, full contact hockey uh, with rules, with checking, with everything, but there's got to be rules and those rules need to be very clearly articulated and they're not. Second part of that, have US academic institutions become too global or are they not global enough? I don't know, I mean, too global. I don't know how you can be too global, a little late for that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, everything's global. Everybody's connected. Everybody's, you know, we're, we're watching what's going on in Ukraine like every hour, every minute, every second, everything going on because it impacts us also. Uh, uh, are they not global enough? Uh, Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think everything's probably moving quick, quickly in that direction. So they're, they're global. Could they be more global? Yes. Uh, number four, and this is the last question that's on the list here. Beyond what is covered in the questions above, are there significant mistakes, problems, and challenges with respect to universities and research to which we are paying inadequate attention? Well, the answer is principally about scale. So everybody wants more engineers, more engineers, more engineers. Okay. Well, then we have to figure out how to teach calculus to more people. And so we've spent millions of dollars figuring out how to teach calculus to more people. And guess what? If you have a different way to teach calculus or a different way to teach organic chemistry or a different way to teach physical chemistry or a different way to teach, uh, uh, you know, uh, complex things, you get more people that are interested and more people that are capable. And so has there been a mistake? The mistake has been to become, you know, overly comfortable with what we've done. 
The mistake has been to not think about the nature of our competition. The mistake has been to not realize that the competition is very healthy and very significant and very capable, which means we've got to up our game in everything that we're doing, which means new tactics, new strategies, and new ways of doing things all the way down to how we teach math. So uh, uh, Artie, maybe I'll stop there and just say that I hope that that for your audience has uh, enticed some questions. And I see uh, Professor Simon on there. Hello, Dennis, how are you doing? And so- Hey, um, how are you? Very good, I'm ready to answer questions, so. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Dennis Simon. I'm the executive director of the center. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate uh, this uh, a portion of uh, President Crow's uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> I had the good fortune of actually working with Michael and uh, I can tell you there's never a dull day at ASU. So uh, as you can see, uh, lots of things uh, going on. L let me throw one question out, which has come up and that is that this balance between uh, domestic and international students. Uh, the kind of university you're, you're creating. Uh, Artie's question about being too global. Um, what is the responsibility of the university to deal with national competitiveness as uh, 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 related to the larger global developmental issues that uh, the world is facing? Yeah, so Dennis, great question. And you're very experienced in all of this. And so we have a, you know, we have a deep commitment to the success of the United States. And the success of the United States is as an international or globally a significant economy is to find talent from everywhere, uh, try to attract it to the United States and see how we can help evolve all things within the United States. And so should we be working, you know, without that in mind, the answer is no, we, we work, we should be working within with thoughts in mind relative to the success of greater Phoenix, the, the success of Southern California and Arizona, the success of the United States, which we do. I still am of the view that you know, we should be attracting as many international students as possible and stapling green cards to their uh, diplomas uh, and, and sending them out about their ways. And so uh, uh, we have over 11,000 international students here with us from 153 countries on campus here with us. And so uh, what we're hoping for is that uh, uh, we can educate many, link with others, uh, build the American economy, but to the root of your question, should we be focused on economic competitiveness and economic success of the United States? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you, you raised an interesting question about engineers. And as you know, if you go through the ABET uh, you know, uh, review of curriculum over the last, let's say 20 years, the definition of what is a good quality engineer, what, how do you define a good engineer? It has to be different as we go deeper into the 21st century, the kind of education that we're giving our engineers versus what we did before. And I'll just give you an example, what uh, ASU is doing in Vietnam in terms of remolding and restructuring the engineering curriculum in Vietnam universities. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit about what's different about an ASU engineer uh, versus the typical engineer uh, the cookie cutter that comes out of many universities. Yeah, so so the one thing that we focused on is the changing of the spirit of engineering to a grand challenge oriented uh, institution here in what we call the Fulton Schools of Engineering at ASU with our 27,000 students, which were growing dramatically even beyond that. And we really took Chuck Vest's idea and the arguments of the National Academy of Engineering of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we said, Let's attract people because they're desirous of impacting sustainability questions and global climate change questions and improving, uh, you know, the electrical grid to uh, enhance life outcomes and all kinds of other things. And so the, the difference here, if there is one, is the attraction of a very diverse student body to these grand challenges with engineering as the mechanism by which people become engaged in these grand challenges. So it's the broadening of the community of engineers to a much broader group of individuals, uh, both ethnically, uh, socioeconomically, culturally, uh, creatively, you know, from every possible aspect. And so I think that's a, a hallmark difference that we, you know, we're not just looking to produce the same person with the 780 SAT score in math only uh, because we've found ways to overcome that. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's, it's really the, the culture of engineering that we've been able to build. Um, there's a question here about uh, community colleges. How can uh, the U.S. Uh, national innovation sy system take better advantage of community colleges and even K through 12 schools uh, as we kind of look to the future of reshaping our innovation system? So we're, those are that's a very important question. So we've decided to lower all of our shields relative to K 12 
Uh, we've got uh, digital assets for any K-12 school, digital partnerships for any K-12 school. We're running our own K-12 schools with 3,500 students in them. We have 60,000 learners in our digital K-12. But the point is, is that, you know, we're trying to work, we're, we're trying to work K through lifetime education, uh, you know, to the community colleges. Um, we're trying to take all of our tools, all of our assets, all of our technologies, just make them available uh, to the K-12 schools. Also work with them, hone them. On community colleges, we've got to find a way to stop this social hierarchy of somehow community colleges are a joke. Uh, just the opposite, you know, they're, they're a, a mainstay of the evolution of our economy. We've got to get more universities to break down the barriers for movement back and forth between the community colleges. We've done a lot of that. We should do more. We can do more. Uh, we've got to break down this notion that uh, uh, community colleges are lesser institutions uh, they're different institutions performing a different kind of function and we need more automatic movement back and forth back and forth between learners companies universities and community colleges here's another question the burden on students in terms of their financial you know, meeting their financial needs is only getting worse and worse uh, is there any solution that you have in mind that they can get the kind of education that you've described and yet be able to handle the funding requirements that are needed to attend colleges, even to attend public universities, which gradually but steadily are becoming more expensive? Yeah, so, so we've kept our in-state tuition at uh, under $11,500. Uh, our net tuition for in-state students is now under uh, $4,000 per year. Uh, with very little public support because of the efficiencies that we gain in the way that we're using technologies. And so, so uh, uh, many faculty members, uh, I think, uh, are concerned about the notion of efficiency. I remember I got booed off a stage once for using the phrase that we should be you know, more efficient, uh, figuratively booed off. Uh, and so we're more polite in academia. And so, and so it, there, are, there are ways to use technologies. There are ways to become more efficient and we need to be constantly, constantly, constantly aware of this. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing with the technologies that we've put in place, new ways to teach math. We've, we've lowered our cost of teaching college math by 50% and then doubled the success rate at the same time just by introducing new technologies. And that's on campus, much less online. So there's <clears throat> a question about administration. So you've thrown out some remarkable ideas, uh, lots of innovative initiatives. Uh, but what is it that university administrations have to do to keep pace with the kinds of things that uh, uh, you seem to want to do? In other words, you're, uh, the idea here is you're a great idea generator, but there are people who have to implement. What is it about the you know, administ university administration today that has to change to make possible this kind of innovative uh, uh, set yeah, of innovative well, that, That's an outstanding question. We could spend an hour talking about that because the, the, the real issue here is that unfortunately universities became something that administrators run versus uh, individuals who are innovators or executives. And so the term executive, you know, a person responsible for lowering the cost, a person responsible for enhancing the quality, you know, those kinds of things. And it's not that faculty are run by executives. They're not, obviously, but the institutions, what they need is they need to be, be become more functionally like enterprises. In fact, we refer to ourselves now at ASU as, as the ASU public enterprise. We're not a government bureaucracy and we're not a business, but we're, we're not run by administrators here. You know, we have faculty members like myself that are responsible for these functions, but it's, it, you know, we're not managing a process. We're managing an innovation culture. We're managing an innovation environment. And so, and so that's just very, very different. Uh, process management in higher education leads to very slow rates of change, very slow rates of adaptation, filio pietistic, you know, adoration of tradition, uh, 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 focus, uh, and so, so what we need is we, we, we need to stop thinking about, oh, that's the administration. We need to start thinking about those are the people that are helping us to evolve. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a change in mindset. And we don't have time today, Dennis, to go through all of that. But this whole notion of, of university administrators and you just get somebody to go in there and sort of mind the store and look at the process, uh, that, that's not going to get us to where we need to be. 
let's carry that over into the curriculum also in terms of traditional degrees, traditional majors, things of that sort. You've described and already mentioned a number of new schools and colleges that have been developed at ASU. What's going to happen to the traditional degree? Well, what's going to happen to the traditional disciplinary training that people have received? It seems like you're talking about a potential revolution that's going to spread across academia, not only in the United States, but all around the world. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's a revolution, but to the question specifically about degrees and so forth. So we have, you know, you can get a degree here in English, you can get a degree in physics, you can get a degree in geology. If you take our degree in geology, it's now rather than a single degree of the geology department, because we don't have a geology department anymore. We have a school of earth and space exploration filled with geologists and astronomers and astrophysicists and astrobiologists and engineers. And so now rather than offering one degree, they're offering five or six degrees. So you can still get the traditional degree and you can get all of these other hybrid degrees. And so what we decided to do was to create hundreds of new degrees, hundreds of new pathways for students to find a thing that excited them. Uh, and, and does it mean that we're producing different kinds of people? Certainly. So I'll take our example of our School of Sustainability. When we were starting our School of Sustainability 15 years ago, people said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. Just have them get a degree in chemistry or a degree in biology or a degree in economics and let them take a couple environmental science courses and they'll be fine. Well, no, we still produce all those degrees also. And we have a transdisciplinary outcome oriented sustainability degree for which we've graduated in the low thousands of people since we started the school. They are trained with foundational understanding of core subjects, but they are also trained as systems level thinkers. It turns out that the world, let's just back up a little bit. Hopefully everyone doesn't think everything's like hunky dory, that all these traditionally trained disciplinary scientists in chemistry and engineering and economics and so forth produce the kind of lack of global climate change ruination that we're moving ourselves toward. But so clearly there's a problem. And a part of the problem is that we're producing too narrow of a set of outcomes from our, from our degree patterns. And so we decided to now launch many, many more degrees. Some are disciplinarily focused, some are not. All are educated well, all are educated to be learners. And so we've just taken on the notion that there are, we're producing too narrow a set of intellectual assets to, to, to really meet all of the challenges that we see lying ahead. What kinds of things can we learn from universities that are located outside of the United States? Have you found any universities that you think are or represent good models or good examples of things that they're doing that uh, American universities might benefit from uh, if they took a closer look? There's, there's tremendous universities everywhere. I mean, we learned a lot from Tech de Monterey in terms of how to stimulate in Monterey, Mexico, how to stimulate student innovation and student engagement. We learned, we've learned a lot from uh, University of New South Wales on the way that they stimulate innovation at scale. Uh, we've got uh, university partners in Paris. There's a, a, a thing there that at least a month ago was called Cree. I think they just rechanged their name, but it's this innovation unit attached to the University of Paris. We've got teams going over there, talking to them, linking with them, understanding them. We've learned a lot from um, uh, KNUST and in Kumasi, uh, Ghana, you know, where they're in upcountry Ghana uh, and, 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 and working to advance a university in that particular region. So we're working with universities all over the world, learning from them, engaging with them. Uh, the new entity that we just started, the TEDI, uh, the Engineering and Design Institute of London, that's a joint project thinking about a new way to teach engineering. So, so lots and lots and lots and lots of things. And then from the universities in China, uh, which are which have heavily older school, older design models, they do have scale. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at scale, how they manage scale, how they work with scale, I think we've learned a lot from them. You mentioned the projects that we have in Vietnam, you know, where we're working to change engineering education. Well, when you're changing anything, we're learning from them as their experiences are evolving and as and in the same way that they're learning from us. So we've been able to, to make a lot of things happen. And then I won't walk you through all the things that we've got going on, but tremendous amounts of, of, of learning and engagement and, and new ways of doing things. I mean, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So the, somebody's raised a question, interesting one. If you look at all the different things you're doing, it seems that the central focus of what the university is about shifts away from simply, as you said, administration to controlling or managing interfaces. 
uh, and that the university becomes much more of a network-like organization uh, because that's the only way it can capture all of this learning that's available all around the world. Um, yeah, very, very observant question. And so what we've really tried to do, and I don't say this in a pejorative way, but we've tried to destroy uh, the basic lockhold of academic bureaucracy. So, so Anthony Downs' book, Inside Bureaucracy, a few decades ago, basically describes how bureaucracies work. And if you read it and you're in academia, you'll be appalled because you'll see that we're basically all petty bureaucrats, that we sit around conserving our resources, our political resources, conserving our organizational resources to protect and defend isolated pockets of power and authority within complex bureaucratic structures. And so what we've tried to do is to enable the faculty to be designers, to design their own trajectories at both the individual level, the unit level, the college level, and the integrated uh, connected level, and then, and then restructured the organization exactly as the questioner said, as a network, you know, uh, as, a, as a network which principal function is to drive design and adaptation to intellectual challenges, new opportunities, new threats, new partnerships, new ways of learning, new kinds of students. And so here's a funny thing, Dennis, you and I, you and I haven't talked about this, but you know, if you were born after 1996 and you carry around one of these things on your body, as most people do, one of these high powered iPhones or cell phones, you're, you're in a different species of human. You know, you're what we call homo sapien.net. Uh, and so homo sapien.nets are going to be different than all the homo sapiens that came before them. And what I mean by that is the nature of the learner itself is transformed because every learner now has access to everything. Now, what does the university do to help that learner that has access to everything to become an even more powerful learner, an even more enabled learner? And, and it, it certainly is the case that there will need to be adaptation. Uh, even on our part, to be able to fully facilitate and capture the full value of that. So that's the way that we're moving forward. So this seems to suggest that the four-year degree, as we know it, is becoming rapidly obsolete. Is that? Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 it certainly could. I mean, uh, I got into an argument with an Ivy League university president a few years ago on a radio show where I said, well, why not try to have different kinds of degrees? I mean, last time I checked, they had three-year degrees in the United Kingdom, and it seemed to work out okay for them. And, and the answer by this individual was, um, it's all a part of the, 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 the building of the person, the, the building of the, of the interaction with the faculty, which I get and I understand and I appreciate. But I don't know in a four year time frame why somebody couldn't get two or three undergraduate degrees and maybe a master's on the side if you altered the learning process a little bit. So you still get the four years of immersion. You might just get a very different set of products for your four years of immersion. Or, or else the, the education has changed, so what comes out at the end of the four years is going to look very different than what used to come out in the four years. Yeah, and, 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 then, uh, and then are there ways for you to finish more quickly than that so you could go on to do something else and then come back a little bit later? Absolutely. And so, so but right now we're locked into a rigid structure of this is a credit hour, this is a course. Uh, I don't know, you tell me why lectures are 50 minutes, you know, meet three times a week. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so somebody, uh, is just to take this going forward, uh, will micro-credentialing, do you think, become much more important uh, in the role in the workforce for people as they pursue their careers and eventually perhaps supplanting degrees? I don't know about supplanting degrees, but will it become more important? Yes, I think degrees will always be important, but micro-credentialing, and each of us will carry some sort of a learning wallet, and in the learning wallet will be, oh yeah, well, you took that course when you were in the army that taught you basic electronics well that then counts uh for something along the way you, you may not get college credit for it but somebody now knows well you also you know dennis simon also understands you know uh electronics or, or dennis in your case you know you know you, you you know you speak multiple languages you've got all these other things going on but you've also learned a lot of other stuff along the way mm -hmm. how does somebody pick up on that and see that and how do you trade so are we going to get to micro credentialing that involves the trading of your information in ways that then give you some advantage in the in the market? Absolutely, absolutely. And people that resist that, they'll just be run over. <laughs> so it, one of the conclusions therefore that one could draw is that the metrics that universities use to evaluate their performance have got to change. 
in order to get them to move and incentivize them to move in, in these directions. So what kind of incentives are used in, in, in your case, uh, do you think that have been uh, successful in getting the university to make these rather dramatic shifts that you've helped to engineer? Well, we, we've changed more. So by the way, some universities will decide or some colleges will decide. I used to be a trustee of Bowdoin College. I mean, it may decide to be the same forever and just attract a few students and work that way. And there's nothing wrong with that. That may be a certain kind of place or a kind of institution that you go to, while other institutions like us are trying to figure out how we can educate 40,000 engineering students. And so, so it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a different kind of approach. But the, the metrics, you know, the, you know, what's really happened here is the change in the design opportunity. So, so can, you, uh, can you empower a faculty in a department to decide that they want to do something in a completely different, differentiated way. So let's take our school of sustainability. Well, they have an executive master's degree in sustainability. They have multiple undergraduate degrees, multiple graduate pathways, pathways within all of those. They put together a certificate in sustainability that educated, uh, uh, you know, 35,000 people in the Starbucks company. You know, I, I won't go through the whole list of all the things that they're doing, but they then, their metrics are not, their metrics are, you know, here's what we're doing to change the world. Here's what our new design is doing to take on the challenge of sustainability. We've got, on, they have online students, on-campus students. Uh, we're evolving new degrees in what we call ASU Sync, where you come in like you and I are talking right now, and we're involved in a degree program, even though I'm living in, you know, Alaska. Uh, and so, and so uh, I think the metrics then are, you know, are you advancing your school's agenda? And then as a faculty member, are you advancing yourself now in what we call super faculty member? You have on-campus students, you have online students, you have graduate students, you have sync students, you have people that you're linked together, you're supported by more staff, you're, you're impacting more lives, you're having more impact across more things, and you have your scholarship or your creativity or your research, again, supported by more people. And so we found ways using technology. Uh, I think we've hired, I don't know, 80 instructional designers, you know, to help faculty to do whatever they want. We've built hundreds and hundreds of online degrees. We never asked anybody to do anything here. They just, we just gave them the resources to do that. So the measurements to your measurement question, each unit's coming up with its own measurements. Each faculty member is coming up with their measurements. And so the traditional measurements of teaching, research and service, those don't really work for us anymore. The, the, the normal measurements of how did you do your teaching? Well, maybe I did all my teaching in a seven and a half week, very intensive, full immersion course, or maybe I spent 30 weeks teaching uh, 300 students in an unbelievable online course. Uh, and so now all of that makes up you as a faculty member in a, in a new and, and flexible kind of way. What do you... What, what do you think, you know, you've talked a lot about in, in your experience at ASU about inclusivity. Let's broaden it from your university to the entire higher education system in the United States. And we have uh, lots of uh, colleges and schools that are from uh, lesser, de lesser developed parts of the country. Uh, they're from poorer areas. Uh, we have a whole set of historically black uh, colleges and universities. We have uh, schools on Indian reservations. In other words, it, this cannot just be a problem for uh, Arizona State University, in other words, this has to be a problem for the higher education system. How are we yeah. going to move people at that other end of the spectrum and get them into uh, being able to make these changes? And we have a bunch of questions that are talking about money here. And so the, the question is, is it only about having the money to do this? Or no. how does this evolution and uh, movement towards even revolution uh, happen in places where uh, things are a little just tougher to get along? Well, one of the things that's really hurt us, and we could spend a whole afternoon talking about this, is that we have, we have, um, we have built a series of institutional hierarchies, which are driving all institutions, including those that are underfunded, those that are serving mostly uh, underserved uh, students, including those with uh, you know every kinds of complexity that you can possibly imagine. They all still have the desire to become something that exists somewhere else. And so what we have is isomorphic replication as a design outcome. And so every college wants to go from R3 to R2 to R1. Uh, community colleges that now want to offer bachelor's degrees so that they can move up the Carnegie rankings. Uh, we, ha we have uh, basically beaten individuality out of the system to a large extent. Uh, and we've built replication in as the system. And then, and then ultimate success 
uh, I won't mention the university, but there are university presidents that have told me that the best thing for me to do at ASU to drive up our rankings is quit admitting students with B averages from high school to your freshman class. Because then all of a sudden your world is much better. All your numbers go up, all your outcomes go up, your four-year graduation rate goes up, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not kidding uh, because there's a, a number of universities that have done that. And so what we, one thing that we need to do to work across the entire spectrum to drive up is to, is to rethink accreditation, rethink classification. I wrote an article a few weeks ago on classification. We have a terrible classification system. We need to now start comparing universities that are actually trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we need innovation going on within each of these clusters of universities. And for those universities on the very front line of social change, where they're picking up the load of trying to upgrade the, the, the educational attainment of a broader section, a broader spectrum of the population, they need to be given help and assistance to accelerate their innovation. So Dennis, you and I are both old and we both will remember 1970. And in 1970, if you were raised in the bottom quarter of, of family incomes, you had like a, 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 a six or 7% chance of getting a college degree in your lifetime. And then today, it's all the way up to 8%. And so, and so we failed. We failed. More than half the people that started college in the United States in the last 40 years have no degree. Uh, and so these are terrible outcomes. That, that, but yet at the same time, you'll go to a university and they'll, or a college and they'll say, just give me more money. I'll segue to money in a second. Give me more money and then I can do what these other colleges are doing. Or let me change my admission standards and I can do what these other colleges are doing. And so I don't want to beat this too hard, but we've got to have a revolution in rethinking the breadth of colleges and universities that we need to serve the country. And those that are on the front line need innovation resources. Uh, and and you know, now that you're running this innovation policy thing, maybe you can focus some energy on that. And then, and then on money, are there, is there a specific question on money? You just want me to talk about money? You know, you can talk about money. I mean, basically, they're trying to say that uh, is just uh, are the poorer institutions, and again, including uh, uh, historically black colleges and universities, yeah. and are, are they just doomed to to languish, or are there ways that they can join? Yeah, and make these changes so that they become not just more relevant, important, they, they, but yeah, that they, they make a bigger contribution uh, to the greater good. In other words, that they're not on the margins, that they yeah. become much more central players because the United States competitiveness problem is a problem that affects all Americans yes. and everyone is part of the, either they're part of the problem or part of the solution. And so how do we make them part of the solution? Well, I, OK, I got it. So 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 so. We need the broadest plethora of institutional types imaginable. We need them spread out across the cultural and sociological landscape of the country. Uh, we need to make sure that we remedy, you know, old outcomes from systemic racism and bigotry. We need, we need everything that we can possibly bring to bear. But what we don't need is every college trying to move up in the rankings of a system which is built on the notion of selectivity. Uh, and so and so we need to move away from that. We need to find a way to uh, accelerate innovation and differentiation in all of these schools. And that's just really, really hard. I'll give you an example. So, you know, we just we just passed our ABET accreditation. I mentioned the size of our engineering school, 27,000 students, and some guy refused to be on the committee. He says there's no way an engineering school of 27,000 students can be any good. So well, I can't be on the committee. I'm like, okay, I didn't talk to the guy, but I would have said, okay, are you, are you like illiterate? <laughs> I mean, meaning, meaning, you know, we have bias in the system that says, well, you shouldn't be admitting these students because they're not prepared, or you should be admitting only the best students, or you should be, you should not be doing this or not be doing this or not be doing that. And you can't scale because if you can't do this or you can't do that, you have to have a classroom size of, you know, not more than 22 students per faculty member. You know, uh, so so if you're at Bowdoin or Amherst or one of these great four year liberal arts colleges, well, that's a different kind of modality. What we need is more rate, types of innovation, more types of institutions where we're measuring outcomes, not constraining methods. Uh, and so right now we have a highly methodologically constrained uh, structure. Okay. Here's a question about uh, COVID. So um, uh, everyone is uh, talking about the post-COVID world. 
And, uh, but don't forget, all of us have gone through COVID. Um, for higher education, are there some specific things that happened as a result of COVID that you think have altered the trajectory of universities as they look into the future? Uh, are there some specific lessons that came out of have, uh, COVID that will really uh, have an impact in the way that we uh, deal with students, deal with learning, deal with teaching, et cetera? Well, I mean, I think one thing that came out of this is that is that uh, universities are essential enterprises. They should never close. They should always find a way to move ahead. They should move forward through whatever we're confronting. Another thing that came out of this is that, and some of us got this um, right and some of us didn't, but all of us tried. And that is, you know, we can teach in different ways. We can engage with people in different ways. I think another positive thing that came out of COVID is... Uh, uh, the rates of innovation at many schools accelerated dramatically and whole new ways of teaching and learning have been, have been uh, developed. Another thing that came from COVID is that, you know, perhaps we can get more cooperation and partnerships and mergers going on between schools. So rather than having a school languishing for 20 years before it finally fades out of existence, you know, maybe it can hook up with someone else along the way and, 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 and find a new path. Uh, another thing that I think that we learned is that perhaps we could work together more and exchange materials more and courses and work together and cooperate in new kinds of ways. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we took the approach here at ASU that we're an essential enterprise. Uh, you know, we had our first case of COVID was in the third week of January of 2020. We had the third known case in the United States. So that for us now then therefore is a hundred, what is that? 109 weeks of COVID that we've had COVID on campus. Wow. And so what we decided was that we're just going to go through this thing and just make it work. And so I think the notion of universities and colleges not being, you know, isolated little gardens of specialty that are away from the front line of society, we're not away from the front line of anything. <laughs> and so what we need to be able to do is to recognize that we're an important institution, institutional type, I should say. Uh, for the rest of society. And, and, and also, I think uh, another thing, this will sound funny, Dennis, but I don't know if people realize how privileged colleges and universities really are within our society. It's almost beyond belief. We have to make sure that we use our privilege in a particular way. I don't believe that the best way to use privilege is, you know, we're all packing up the farm here and we'll be back when the storm is over. <laughs> you know, I, I think that there's some merit in we're never packing up the farm. We're going to adjust to the storm, whatever it is. Uh, and we're going to be of the greatest service that we could possibly be, not just to our students, but to the places where we live. You know, a number of universities, including ours, developed our own testing systems. We vaccinated millions of people. You know, we, we, we launched uh, every, you know, PPE networks to manufacture. I mean, you know, colleges and universities, some of them all over the country turned into, you know, basically response units. Uh, and I think all of us should do that always in, when these things come up. We shouldn't think of ourselves as isolated from the mainstream struggles of the country. We should be in the throes of the mainstream struggles of the country. And that's at least something that we came away with. How can we do that more? Well, here's a, a, a question that follows up from that. And this is about middle-aged re-entry students, uh, people who've been in the workforce and for whatever reason, uh, they've decided to go back to school. Uh, if you compare the young learners, as you said, who are holding up a, a phone and it's part of their physiology now, what about these, you know, middle aged uh, older workers who now need to be reskilled, retrained, they're willing to do so? Uh, how do you approach them? Uh, because their needs are completely different than that 18, 19 year old that's coming onto your or other campuses. So one of the things that we're doing, and there's other universities and colleges doing this also, is we've decided to you know, call them something. So we're calling them universal learners. Uh, we're, we're, we're now working to take every asset that we have that could be consumed by them that doesn't diminish something for someone on campus. We're finding every other asset that we have, our library, other assets that we have, other partnerships that we have, and we're creating a portfolio of learning modules, learning things, courses, micro uh, bachelors, uh, micro masters, uh, uh, all kinds of things that they might need, courses that they could teach to their children at home. We're taking all of this and we're organizing it into what we call the learning enterprise. And this goes way beyond continuing and professional education deeper down into the society. And so basically what we're doing is we're saying, let's take down all of our shields. Let's take everything that we have that's consumable. Let's make it available to anyone that needs it. Uh, and uh, keep the transaction costs very, very low. It turns out that we have massive public good assets within all colleges and universities. How do we make them available? 
uh, and and that's sort of the approach that we're taking. And then and then we're also beginning to think through, you know, how does the 80 year old uh, learn and want to continue their learning because they always wanted to study philosophy and they were never able to, and they might bring a whole new perspective. So one of the things our philosophy faculty have learned since we've been offering our online degree in philosophy is they never met students like this before. And it's really affected them, really impacted them. Older students who are coming from different perspectives and different, different realms of life, different faith backgrounds, different hybridization sociological transformations that they've, that they've been through. And so, so what we're finding is that, you know, we're basically teaching a narrow set of pre-selected individuals who meet our requirements for entry to the institution. Well, if we take on a broader set of people, who knows what creative things will come out of that? And so we're very excited about this. And I know a number of other colleges and universities are also. But the United States, okay, the, the 80 the eighty year old studying philosophy, of course, is, is it's intriguing and it's, uh, it's our curiosity. But what about the 50 year old? In other words, yeah. they have another 15, 20 years of, uh, you know, uh, productive work left in them, you know, in terms of energy and physical and well-being, etc. How can they make the transitions? Because we you've described them, um, as you said, a very complex world that's emerging. Already mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. How are we going to get those people? people over the hump uh, to be able to be uh, make a contribution uh, because we need all the help we can get. Yeah. So what we're doing with them is so now we we're offering them uh, any one of our 300 online degrees, any one of our thousands of courses. We're then offering them any of those courses or many of those courses as individual courses. And then we're also organizing every learning asset that we can find that we have internally, that we can partner with someone else. And we're organizing that into a portfolio of learning assets to help the 50 year old that wishes that they'd finished these math courses or wishes that they'd been able to take a few more writing courses or wishes that they had some other way to learn programming or something like that. We're putting all of that together for them also in partnerships. Okay. Um, Okay, here's a question from someone obviously may feel a little bit of frustration, but uh, he wants to know if I'm a mid-level administrator who really has bought into the idea that innovation is important in my institution, how can I make something happen? Uh, there, as you identified, there are a lot of barriers. There are a lot of uh, legacy systems. Uh, how can I help uh, generate more innovative activity? What would be a, a good first, second, you know, third step to get the ball rolling inside my institution? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question uh, because often there's uh, forces that keep the mid-level uh, executive, mid-level administrator from, from innovating. And so this may be somewhat reflective of my own weird personality, but you, you basically find people who want the innovation that you're working on, activate them. And because of the culture of most colleges and universities being responsive to people that want to move in a new direction, you empower them to move in a new direction. So you build a, a cadre of co-innovators or a cadre of supporters or a cadre of people who have then used the innovation to demonstrate something and you just make that happen. I mean, uh, you know, you take the openness of the university, you don't ask around, uh, you know, you, you just do it uh, and, and, and see what happens. And, and uh, we've got a lot of that going on here. And a lot of people are hesitant to do that. Uh, but if you can get, what you wanna do is just get the slightest proof point of the innovation, just the slightest proof point, and then try to move forward from that. You made a, you made a point before about the uh, community of uh, higher education institutions. Not everyone needs to be like ASU. Uh, some, I think it was Bowden you mentioned, or another one said, you yeah. know, they're going to basically, they're happy staying where they are. If, if you were designing uh, the, the, the perfect uh, landscape for higher education in the United States, what would that structure look like? How, you know, small, big, private, public, uh, polytechnic, you know, uh, liberal arts, et cetera. Where, where would you, you know, wh how, how would that community look like according to Michael Crow's view of the ideal perfect higher education system? I think, I think the way to look at it is not what it would look like, but how it would operate. And that is that you would allow for more differentiation you would allow for continuous evolution. Uh, you would allow for the birth of new kinds of institutions not to be beaten down by the existing institution. So, you know, we're trying to emerge here at ASU as a national service university. Purdue is trying to emerge as a national service university. 
Penn State, Maryland, a few other schools are sort of moving at that scale. University of Massachusetts, a few others. Uh, and so, and so, what one says is that you know what we want is a is a culture in the in the framing of the design of the institutional types that are out there that is highly diverse, highly differentiated, with related and relatable missions, but not the same missions. Mm -hmm. And and we and, and and we can't have people saying, well, listen, I can't I can't accredit your engineering school; it's too big. Uh, uh, you know, what we need is a recognition. Well, if we don't grow bigger engineering schools, how are we going to produce more engineers? Because we're not building new engineering schools. We're not building new engineering schools from scratch. It's either build new ones, find other ways to produce engineers. I'm just using that as an example. And so what we need uh, in all of this is we need, we need openness to differentiated designs. And so let's say that, that, uh, uh, you know, and I think that we also need, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll lay this down and Dennis, you know, that we're really big on this is that, you know, we're going to have to use technology. We mm -hmm. can't scale the same model to the level of, you know, 50 million people in college and hundreds of millions of people in education, advanced education beyond high school for the, you know, at some point in their life, we've got no, we have no way to do that. We're not going to build thousands of more institutions but we may build and enhance tools that would allow the existing thousands of institutions that we have to do more. Okay. Okay. We have time. One last question. Um, this is a good one to end on. If you could, uh, if you had a magic wand and could uh, wave that wand across higher education, what's the one big change that you'd like to see happen uh, that could really make a difference going forward? Uh, the one big change would be that the, uh, those that are leading the uh, highly selective, uh, uh, quote unquote, elite institutions begin talking more broadly about how higher education needs to reform to meet the national needs, rather than, than protecting and defending their position. Uh, and and uh, some have done that. Ron Daniels at Johns Hopkins just came out with, you know, what do universities owe democracy? Well, they owe a lot. But a democracy of 335 million people can't be served by a series of institutions that control their enrollment to only A students from high school. Uh, and, so, and so what we need is recognition by the broader leadership of higher education of the kinds of things that higher education needs to do in the United States to be successful. And if I was to add to that, you know, we need very serious reform in what is a course, what is a credit, what is this? What is that? We need innovation in all of that also. Those are two really important things that we need. Well, great. Well, Michael, thank you very much. You did not disappoint as I suspected you would, you would not. Um, it really brought us some great ideas and uh, you gave us a lot to think about. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, you will leave many people uh, going in out of this uh, session with uh, uh, many, many ideas to consider as they, they look at the landscape for, for higher education. So thank you uh, very, very much again. It was nice seeing you. And uh, we'll now move on to our president's okay. panel, uh, which will be moderated by the law school dean, uh, Kerry Abrams. And again, thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Bye-bye now.